A very good morning to everyone. Goedemorgen, uh, goedemiddag. Uh, I think we're both here from the Netherlands and the US today. Um, with me, I have Jacqueline Jungblut and Nadine Galay, which we'll introduce further in a second. Uh, my name is Mark Duitsmeyer. I'll be hosting your session today. I'm an attaché for innovation. Um, we are the Netherlands Innovation Network and we bridge the Atlantic. We are uh, on science and technology. So uh, what we generally do is that we help businesses, researchers, organizations connect to the other side of the ocean from the US to uh, the Netherlands and the other way around. And today I have a prime example of this cooperation, um, which we'll talk about in a minute. But before we do so, I wanna ask you guys some quick questions in the chat. Um, so get your, your pens or keyboards ready. First question is, uh, type a one in the chat if you work for a city and a two if you work for a startup. Three if neither of those. All right, I see city, four cities, that's, that's good. A startup, oh, and I see a, a one free, it's, it's, uh, it's neither a city or a startup or both. And it's another free, all right, that's a great mix. Um, so we have all flavors. I, that's great, because as Jacqueline already mentioned in the chat, we'll also look forward to hearing your perspectives of what we talk about today. Um, another question, uh, type of one, if you've ever been in a collaboration between a city and a startup. <laughs> Nadine, all right, I am gonna, um, I see Kim, uh, and Josh, you both mentioned. We'll, we'll really look forward to hearing your um, hearing your views on that. I do see right now. I was going to pull you in now, but they didn't give me the full right. So I'm going to during the presentation going to fix that. So we'll definitely look forward to hearing your perspectives on what we've told here today, because this is also an example of that. Um, all right. So what's going to happen today? Uh, Jacqueline and Adina are going to tell you, present a little bit about their project and mostly about how they uh, cooperate between cities and startup, after which I will facilitate a short conversation with the both of them. Um, we'll also open up the floor to you guys afterwards to have a conversation. If you have any questions in the meantime, please feel free to drop them in the chat. I'll be keeping an eye on the chat, so I'll bring those questions to Nadina and Jacqueline whenever it fits, whenever it best fits. Um, so I'm going to go over to Jacqueline Youngblood, who is uh, the chief of staff of the mayor's office of New Urban Mechanics. And if you ask me, uh, this is an interesting name, but it is an amazing, uh, in innovative organization in the city. I've gotten to know them over the past year as really the ones that drive innovation, drive change within the city of Boston. So um, without further ado, Jacqueline, I'm going to give the floor to you and please let us know how you've um, how you've done your work with Nadine and how the new office of new urban mechanics does their work. Great, thank you, Mart. And if I could just get a verbal confirmation from you that you're seeing my screen full screen. Great, okay, thanks Nadina. Um, good morning, good afternoon, everyone. Thank you so much for joining us. Uh, Nadina and I are really excited to be here at Impact Fest along with Mart um, to tell you a little story about a project that we did together called TreeTect. Um, and before we dive into that, I just wanted to give a little bit of overview of what and who New Urban Mechanics is, to Mart's point, um, and a little bit of the Boston context so that you have that in your mind as, um, as we sort of go through this conversation and as Nadina shares a little bit more about the project. So I just wanted to, to take a moment to sort of ground ourselves. I know there's a lot going on around the world um, and you know, our team in particular is really committing to reorienting toward anti-racism here in the US and asking what that can look like within the civic innovation field. Um, we have been around as a team for over 10 years and just acknowledging that we have more questions now than we ever have and certainly more questions than we have answers. Um, and also just an acknowledgement that there's a lot of um, really challenging things that, that we're facing on a daily basis. And we bring that to the work um, and to the conversation, including racism, 
um, obviously the pandemic, climate change, you could add you know, economic uncertainty, so many things. Um, and just really wanted to name that before we dive in. And so as Mart said at the beginning, you know, we hope that this will be a conversation after we give you a little bit of context, but hopefully not um, too much lecturing um, and, and hope that you will engage in those conversations here in this session and in any other sessions uh, that you may attend during Impact Fest. Um, please be critical, please ask questions. We look forward to sharing. So just wanted to, I'm not going to go through this, but wanted to give you, in case you're not familiar with Boston, just a quick sort of snapshot, um, you know, roughly 700,000 residents, you can see the sort of age span, gender span, um, education level, you know, we are, you know, often people know Boston for its universities, um, and a sort of mix of um, ethnicities there. So hopefully that will just ground you a little bit. And as Mart said, you know, the, the somewhat strangely named uh, Mayor's Office of New Urban Mechanics, this was our former mayor, Tom Menino, who was uh, Boston's longest serving mayor, served for 20 years. Um, and the press liked to call him the urban mechanic. And this was sort of tongue in cheek. It was um, sort of describing his nuts and bolts approach to um, to city administration, right? He wasn't known for his sort of big strategic plans. He was very much known for, you know, how do I help Nadina get her pothole fixed? Or how do I make sure that the street lights on Mart's streets are working? And so, you know, we always just like to give um, a little bit of homage to our, our founding mayor. Um, and since our current mayor Walsh has taken office, um, the team has grown, which is fantastic. Um, and, and both mayors, I think, ask this question of, you know, what or, or who is it that we're optimizing for? Um, you know, sometimes in the private sector innovation world, it's all about, you know, uh, profits or um, efficiency maximizing. Um, and that is that is really not the frame that we come to civic innovation uh, from, right? We're, we're not a market. We have to serve all of our residents. We, we get to serve all of our residents. Um, and so we, we really come at it from uh, an equity lens and saying, how do we design for, how do we sort of optimize for um, people who are often designed out of conversations? And so, um, you know, this is, this is our uh, Lego interpretation of our team. Um, and just a shout out to Kim Lucas, who's on the call, who was a former teammate of ours. Um, we prototype um, service designs, product designs, um, new programs, policies, you name it, we have probably tried it. Um, and the, the idea is always to um, you know, make things better for residents um, in Boston. And that is broadly defined, of course, um, but that is, that is the main goal. And this is the team as it currently stands today. So we're nine people. Um, we work across um, the transportation department, the housing department, uh, a lot of public health work uh, over the last couple of years, um, supporting folks who are um, struggling with substance use disorders, who are coming out of our prison and jail systems, um, thinking about technology in the public realm and the public right of way. So all the sensors and sort of smart city uh, type conversations. We do a lot of work with the Office of Food Access, it really spans. Um, and our backgrounds are, are very different as well. We have videographers and you know, urban planners, computer scientists, community organizers, artists, um, a real wide range of, of folks. And I think that's what um, makes the potential for collaboration in this ecosystem that you know, we, we share with Nadina and Mart makes it so possible because we're able to tap into all of these, these people's different perspectives. And, and so again, just to reiterate, um, we really focus in our civic innovation on people um, and how we support people. It's not just about all of the flashy tech and the, the cool new things, right? Innovation is, does not have to be something brand new. Um, but it's about how are we thinking about people? How are we centering the experiences of our residents? How are we centering their expertise? Um, and we'll get into that a little bit with the prototype. So of course, every group has their little spiel um, and this is sort of an interpretation of ours. I think the point here is just to say there's sort of multiple phases of work and, and really it looks something more like this. Um, and so in that explore side of the, of the house, um, we're really thinking about you know, potential projects are coming in from anywhere. They're coming in from our mayor, they're coming in from academics, from artists, from uh, youth groups. Um, and we're sort of trying to match that with the existing context of what we know is happening, what's going on in the city. We're sort of, you know, as a mayor's office, we look across the entire administration. And so we say, oh, we know this is happening in parks. We know this is happening in the environment department. And then what's that policy window? Like what is happening in the sort of general Boston environment that could make this project possible or, or less possible. 
at this moment. And as we're sort of taking in all those pieces, we try and chunk out a little prototype, a little experiment. And that word is sort of, you know, uh, is problematic in a lot of contexts. Um, but the point being the sort of provocation, can government learn? Can local government do something that is experimental in the sense that the point is to learn, not to necessarily um, prove that we will get it right the first time, right? That's a really hard thing for, for anyone to do, but it's particularly difficult for local governments. And so uh, this whole sort of approach is, is more of a provocation about can government do differently? And then we, we sort of look at what happened and say, okay, should this scale and what does that mean? Should it just end? It's okay if it just happens once and then, and then that's it. Um, or did it fail? And was it a generative failure? Was it a sort of apocalyptic failure? And what did we learn from that failure? Um, and there really should be another line that sort of brings you back to the explore phase. Um, just a quick uh, sort of lessons learned. And, and I think uh, we can get into this with um, our tree tech project in the Q&A, um, because I think Green City Watch and Nadina's team fit so many of these. Um, but over the years, over the 11 years we've been doing this work, right? Um, you know, the process, the how is just as important as the what. Um, really asking this question of, can we use technology to do something other than be more efficient or save money? Is it even possible in theory to use technology to build trust? Compassion, I think TreeTech is a great example of that and we'll talk you through that. Um, can we encourage and enable civic behavior? Um, how do we get residents to care for their common environments? How do we get residents to care for each other? Um, and again, I think TreeTech is, is a cool example or, or has applications that could be examples of that. Um, being delightful, right? Working in this ecosystem of innovation and cities and startups, um, so often it's, it's all about sort of you know, hustling and, and just going as, as fast as you can and, and getting to the next milestone. And I think we um, have really appreciated the partnership with Green City Watch, um, just in how much joy it brought to our partners internally, externally, um, and the, the sort of surprising, you know, wonder, wondrous parts um, really make the projects um, possible within this broader context that I, that I gave at the beginning, right? There's a public health emergency. Why are we doing a project about, you know, uh, can we use satellite imagery for trees? but um, we'll get into that. And then the last two are maybe specific to local government, but um, building things that people actually want and need, not just what city governments are already good at, at building, which is you know, maybe roads and we're really good at buying things for you know, really expensive contracts, um, it, but maybe that's not what people want from us. Um, and then finally, sort of creating this comfort with risk-taking um, in city government. So how can we support the planning and development agency to try something different or to um, do something that may be a little bit politically risky, but in fact uh, could be interesting if, if they had the space to do that. So before I hand it off to Nadina, I just wanted to sort of come back to that funnel and, and sort of give you the, the setup for this prototype, this um, civic research prototype that we did together. Um, so again, uh, Kim Lucas is, is on the call, very glad for that. Um, she used to run the city's open data portal. And so in conversations with her, looking at the last time that Boston had done a tree inventory, a, a full tree inventory, um, was 2010, right? So that data was very old. And so we said, okay, what's going on there? But we knew the Parks Department and Josh Altador is on the line. Hi, Josh, um, from the Parks Department in Boston. Um, so we knew there was a 2014 LIDAR data set um, and there was about to be a 2019 update. Um, I'm not sure if our friends at Speak for the Trees are on the line, but uh, David and team, um, we're doing uh, some inventorying with uh, young folks, but also just residents of any age, um, going out and, and doing some inventorying across the city. Um, I think largely because the city wasn't moving fast enough. And so just to, to sort of show that it really does take an ecosystem um, to move these projects forward. And then we knew that there were discussions about engagement, there were discussions on heat islands, um, and we knew that Parks was about to do an urban forest plan. And so the policy window was sort of right um, at the moment that we were introduced to Nadina through a connection um, from a food access project, right, which seems like maybe it's not relevant, but in fact, um, the, the network effect and the ecosystem is, is very strong in Boston. Um, and so we met Nadina and Green City Watch and started talking about what this uh, technology that they had was and, and how we might be able to apply it. So we sort of talked through, and, and again, Nadina, I'm sure we'll talk about this and we can bring it up in the Q&A as well. Um, you know, should we use the application of this um, sort of algorithm, machine learning, you know, assessment of, of satellite imagery 
as civic engagement? Is it a maintenance strategy for our parks department, for Josh and his team? You know, what is the thing that we're trying to understand? Um, and I think really framing it as a research prototype was, was really helpful in that. And I just put the two projects on the end over there to say, you know, we had done this other work um, earlier and that sort of informed uh, the, the exploration as we came to talk to Nadina and you know, the Parks Department and the Environment Department Planning and Development Agency. So Adopt-A-Tree was um, a summer fellow project that just sort of ended. Um, you know, you could, a resident could sign up to take care of a tree. There was sort of a, a um, you know, online map, a web app um, that folks could interface with. Um, and it was intended to be an engagement strategy. Um, I think quite simply, we lost the person who was running the code um, and updating the code. And so um, the project just sort of ended. Um, and then Streetcaster was a project about um, investing in equitable infrastructure. And it was more about sidewalks, but uh, with Nadina and the Parks Department, we said, could we think about trees as equitable infrastructure? And could we continue this sort of line of inquiry about uh, equitable infrastructure via trees? Um, so just to, to show sort of how all of those pieces came together to make tree tech possible. Um, and so I will turn it over to Nadina to get more into the nitty gritty of what the project was and what Green City Watch did. Um, and then hopefully we can um, open it up to Mark's conversation, facilitated conversation, and then also Q&A from you all. Thanks a lot, Jacqueline. Um, Nadine, we go over to you. Uh, let me briefly introduce you. Uh, Nadine is the co-founder and chief ecological engineer of uh, Green City Watch. And um, just like Jacqueline, actually, I got to know Nadine last year when she was in Boston as part of her uh, research at MIT Sensible City Lab. And also, ah, it's great you have this picture up, actually. Um, got to know her as someone who's really trying to combine her I really think intrinsic motivation research to create a product that's actually built to uh, impact society in a great way. And I think therefore great fit for Impact Fest. Um, Nadina, you have other positions as well. So maybe introduce yourself and over to you. Thank you. Thank you so much, Mart. And thank you so much uh, everyone on this call for joining us uh, at Impact Fest. We're really excited to share what we've done together with the city of Boston. Um, Mart already did a fantastic job introducing me. Um, uh, here I am in this photo here taking soil samples uh, on the streets of Cambridge and Boston. And that was part of my PhD research um, while I was at MIT Sensible City Lab this past year. Uh, last month, I actually defended my PhD in ecological engineering. And Green City Watch is an organization that I co-founded um, with, uh, with two um, earth scientists uh, that we met during our master's program, really with the focus on being able to use the latest advancements in remote sensing for this kind of up and coming budding field of ecological engineering and urban ecology more generally. Uh, so without further ado, so to kick us off, uh, since I was a kid, I've been fascinated by how the earth functions and specifically how it reacts and recovers, if at all, from disturbances. And arguably the largest disturbance to ecosystems uh, worldwide has been urbanization. We now know that 3 million people are moving or being forced to move to cities every single week. So that's five people per second, some 1500 odd people just since this presentation started. And we all know about these challenges that cities face, um, but I believe it's critical to understand that never before have people lived in cities and in cities of this magnitude. Cities are these completely novel ecosystems for both humans and nature. And we really must figure out how to balance both human and nature's need if we wanna to move towards a healthy and sustainable future for all species. So while we fight to keep our cities green and make them greener, there's another common urban discourse and uh, Jacqueline already alluded to it, which is of course the discourse of smart cities. And whether we like it or not, our cities are going digital and smart cities put data and technology to work to drive efficiency and improve the quality of life for all citizens. Yet the natural capital upon which these very same cities rely often risks being left behind by the digital revolution. 
So these two discourses, they seem to run parallel to one another in their own silos. So I've become focused on how can smart cities uh, change how we actually might manage this urban natural capital. So uh, this past year with a fellow PhD student, Sophie Nidoslavsky, uh, and my PhD supervisor, Francesco Pila, we actually uh, wrote a paper on this and we wanted to understand how you could actually use technology for this enhanced management of green infrastructure in cities. And we quickly realized that the opportunity was ripe to develop a framework for this. And we call this the Internet of Nature. And it's this novel concept that utilizes digital technologies and smart applications to elicit information about urban ecosystems. But really the goal here, whatever application it might be, it's really not about the technology. It's all about how can we use these different new methods simply as tools to both enhance green benefits, but also reconnect people back into nature. And there's a whole host of different examples here. Um, but today, I of course want to tell you about the potential of using very high resolution remote sensing to basically quantify and monitor some of the ecosystem services that green infrastructure offers. And this, of course, is uh, at the heart of what Green City Watch does. So why, why now? Well, this is actually research from the Boston, uh, from Boston University that shows these differences in, in how cities or how trees operate in cities. So um, I know for our, for our arborists and, and tree specialists on this call, hi Josh, uh, this, is, this is no news, um, but trees have a really difficult time in cities. Um, they actually, they, they grow incredibly fast because they do a lot of times get all the resources that they need, but at the same time, they do have a, a limited lifespan. And this is this is prob problematic because um, it's not the young trees in our cities are actually not the ones that are offering all of these different benefits that we've come to rely on trees for. So things like intercepting stormwater, filtering air pollutants, providing us with a source of stress relief and happiness, um, and, and many, many, many more known kind of broadly as these ecosystem services. The more mature the tree becomes, actually the greater benefits um, they have. So it's, it's, it's become in urban forestry's interest to really not just focus on planting new trees, but actually focus on the maintenance and the preservation of older mature trees. Now, how do cities keep track of all these trees? Quite simply put, they would use a tree inventory. And a tree inventory is what exactly? It is essentially the, ga the gathering of accurate information, sometimes with a spatial component on the health and diversity of an urban forest. So essentially a database of all the different trees that a city is in charge of. Um, so I said it already there, typically tree inventories are are trees that are in the management of a city. So it could be all the public trees, or it could simply be the street trees, for example. Typically, a tree inventory is done with uh, field tree technicians on the ground, as you see here in the photo, that go around and identify each individual tree, the age, the, the species, the size, the location, using a GPS tracker, um, and the condition, of course. Um, there are a couple of challenges when it comes to uh, this more traditional way that tree inventories are being done. For one, um, it can be quite difficult to actually um, make sure that these uh, this data is updated. As Jacqueline mentioned, pre the previous inventory of Boston had been done in 2010. So at that point, it had been nine, 10 years after the fact. And the reason being why this is often outdated is because a tree inventory doing it in this way can take three to seven years to complete. So by the time you've inventoried that first tree and you've reached your last one, well, that inven the inventory date of the first tree might actually already be outdated. Um, there was a study by the USDA Forest Service researchers, which found that because it's so timely and therefore so expensive to do, citizen science might actually be used. Now, this is a fantastic way to engage citizens, but has already in the research brought up some concerns about the data quality of these. Uh, they can also be fragmented. So as I mentioned, if they're only done about the street trees or the public trees, in most cities, uh, only 30 to 50% of the trees in a city are actually on public land. The rest are all on private land. And just because a tree is on private land doesn't mean that community isn't benefiting from all, that, all those benefits that tree has to offer. Um, and of course, when I say we're using, you know, 
remote sensing satellite imagery to detect the health of an urban tree. What I mean by that is actually using something called hyperspectral imagery to actually detect very niche changes in the vegetation that might actually offer us a way to step in and uh, alert the troops, if you will, about the status of the health of that tree before it might even be visible to the human eye. So in short, this sector is, is ripe for innovation and we're very excited to get the opportunity to work with the city of Boston to prototype this idea that we've been working on for a while. And that idea is TreeTech. And essentially what TreeTech does is it aims to use only high resolution satellite imagery. The reason I emphasize only is because that's the only way to keep a tool like this cost effective and usable for cities. Um, and what we might go about measuring with the satellite imagery is um, some different attributes that you might not measure in the field per se. So here you can kind of see a side-by-side -side comparison, very rough of what this might look like. So again, with a manual inventory, it absolutely has, had, has its benefits and by no means should tree tech ever be seen as a replacement. It is simply a complement to either get a baseline inventory out where there is no information available or augment an existing inventory that's looking for more regular monitoring. So a manual inventory is always gonna do many more attributes than you would uh, do from remote sensing simply because you're in the field, you have an expert in the field who's able to notice those things. The big advantage though is of course, when it comes to the time and the cost. So using it this way, you can do many more trees for much cheaper. The accuracy here, the reason why there's such a difference is of course, it depends on the, on the attribute that you're measuring. If that attribute is the canopy spread, I know because I've done this in the field with my measuring tape, you're gonna be a lot more accurate when you do that from satellite imagery. Species on the other hand, Yes, there are steps being made to identify species based on satellite imagery, but that is gonna be no match for an arborist with so many years of experience in the field identifying that tree. And of course, one of the things that we're most excited about is the opportunity for actually being able to use this to regularly monitor trees so that we don't have to go another 10 years before that inventory gets updated. So just to quickly, give you an idea of some of the data sources that we used while working with the city of Boston um, is we used, first we had to select of course our area of interest, which we decided was Nubian Square, uh, which is a neighborhood in, in Roxbury for the, in the south of Boston for the Dutch people on the call. And um, there was a number of reasons why uh, this neighborhood um, was selected, which we can get into a little bit more in the Q and A, because I think it's relevant to how, how this kind of civic tech process works as well. Uh, we used um, both the LIDAR from 2014 and the 2019, which we got really lucky that we were able to, that that was processed in time for us to be able to use it. Of course, we used the optical um, imagery as well as the hyperspectral imagery. And we got very lucky that um, we were working uh, in, in um, that we were working with a couple of different tree inventories that had been done in the area. So for one, uh, the MIT tree inventory and the Cambridge tree inventory, which of course, yes, is not Boston, but because so many of the uh, species are similar, it adopted as a good training data set. And we were also able to work with um, Speak for the Trees Boston, um, which I know David is on the call. Hi, David, thank you for joining us. Um, and that was really great to be able to have trees that were inventoried on the ground so that we might be able to use that as a ground truthing data set as well. So these are just some of the preliminary results. And basically what we focused on with the development of tree tech is not so much all the other attributes of, of looking at canopy spread and, um, and the health of different trees. We did do that, but the real, the focus here was in an area where a tree inventory does not exist, can we actually go about locating uh, and detecting the locations of trees? So here you can see some of the different um, areas where we tested this um, with, um, with quite some accuracy. So in total, we identified about 2,046 trees in the Nubian Square area, and that's on both public and private land. And then lastly, we used um, an enormous amount of hand annotations, which is what helped us get the accuracy of the tree tech algorithm for Nubian Square specifically at such a high accuracy. Um, this is over what's been done in the state of the art, which was in a forest. And again, this is very different to doing it in a forest because in an urban setting, there's gonna be a lot more distractions, if you will, from what might be considered a tree, even if it's not. 
Just because we were able to achieve this high accuracy in Nubian Square does not mean TreeTech is immediately able to roll out and achieve this accuracy in other areas of the country, let alone other areas of Boston. That all remains to be seen and will likely will need several more hand annotations to make this as scalable as we truly want it to be. And we believe with that scalability also becomes the cost effectiveness and with cost effectiveness becomes um, accessibility. And that at the end of the day is really our mission with all of this. Um, throughout the development of TreeTact, it became very clear to us that as a mission driven organization to truly be able to bring tree tech to the masses. The, the only model that made sense uh, for that was an open source model. So we invite you to check out all of the code, the workflows that we developed for tree tech. They're all available on our GitHub page. And if you're keen to perhaps develop tree tech further for another city, we would love to hear from you. So please check out our website and reach out. Thank you. Thank you, Nadina. Yeah, we, we clap like this after you try and. Uh... Um, thanks a lot. And uh, two quick remarks. Uh, I love how you end, ended with the open source and how you try to share this to create impact. Um, and also you mentioned a few times that we were so lucky that X or so lucky that Y. I do think people determine their own luck. So um, I think you guys did a great job in doing so during this project. So a few people came in during um, the last presentation. So I'm just going to reiterate I'll be hosting a quick conversation between Jacqueline and Adina. If you have any burning questions, uh, drop them into the chat. Um, afterwards, we'll also open up the floor for you to actually come in, raise your hand and come into the conversation. So there's also wait for that, but if there's anything you really need to know right now, just drop it in the chat and I'll be sure to field that question again. Um, but I'd like to start here. So in any cooperation there's there's a start there's a first moment and Jacqueline already briefly mentioned it but I wonder so how did you first how did the two of you first connect and also like was it love at first sight like did you know like this is going to be a project for us so uh, I'm curious to hear how this how this happened Nadina do you want to start and I'll fill in any gaps uh yes I think it happened because I um I, I knew that I was headed to Boston and Cambridge for the research fellowship at MIT, Sensible City Lab. And I think through a mutual connection on um, LinkedIn, I got in touch with Scott Beatty and had a couple of calls with Scott Beatty and who is kind of very much uh, invested in, in the tech startup scene uh, in Boston and surroundings. And Scott had previously worked on a project with Jacqueline, which is how Jacqueline and I met. So I think we had a call before I even got to Boston virtually. Uh, and then I think we had coffee in the first two or three weeks that I was there. And I'll just add, um, and I apologize if there's a little bit of background noise, you know, the work from home situation, there's multiple conference calls happening at once. Um, one thing that New Urban Mechanics really tries to do is to be a, a front door or an opening for startups, um, for researchers, for artists, as I mentioned, um, to to sort of come and have a conversation with the city, right? I don't know what, what all of the attendees' experiences are, but it can be really hard to navigate. Like, who do I go to in the local administration? Is it the parks department? Should I go to the head of the entire, you know, streets cabinet? Where do I start? And so for New Urban Mechanics, we, one tangible example of that is we host um, office hours twice a week. And so anyone can, you know, book 30 minutes with us, or we will use that time to seek out new ideas. Um, and so Nadina's introduction really came in through that sort of lens of you know this is a potentially interesting idea we're not sure if there's something here but maybe there is and it's worth exploring um, and so that sort of willingness to take anybody's first call I think um, you know one of our co-founders Nigel uh, Jacob would say you know always say yes to the first meeting you never know what kind of conversation is going to happen you can't know a priori if it's going to be a useful thing and and of course with Nadine and Green City Watch it turned out to be very interesting um, but we also had to do some some sort of dot connecting, right? To get the parks department and the environment department and the planning and development agency. We had emergency management in there for a bit in the mix. Um, so it's really it's really about connecting those dots as well. Um, and I think I think Nadine and I had a good sense that there would be a project here somewhere. And it was just about figuring out like what is the what are the research questions? What are the civic research questions we're asking? Right. And that actually brings you me to another question. 
because um, that's the first start. First, you connect and you say, hey, there's a project here. There's something we can do. But the actual project and research question still had to be determined. So how, maybe that's also interesting. So how did that process look like? like was it an iterative process or was it someone who said, no, it's going to be like this? I'm curious to hear. Maybe I'll start and then Nadina, you, you can take over. Um, <clears throat> I think Nadina might tell you that it was many emails back and forth of long paragraphs of feedback from all of our various stakeholders. Um, so it was actually very interesting, Nadina sort of alluded to this, of the eventual decision to, to go with Nubian Square in Roxbury. We had two locations that we were looking at that uh, Green City Watch was kind enough to sort of scope out, like how expensive would it be to do this project here versus here? What, you know, helping us set some constraints of what can they reasonably do? We set a very aggressive timeline um, for the grant that we were, were working on. We really needed to get this done in about two, two and a half months. And so we were sort of running out of time. And so we said, okay, we're not gonna do the whole city. We know that. Um, so what, what kind of area can we do? Um, and the other area that we looked at was um, Mattapan Square, which is also a neighborhood in the South of Boston. Um, the planning and development agency was is currently running a, a sort of two year planning process in Mattapan Square or in, in Mattapan. Um, and they they were curious if there were other ways to engage residents in a conversation about a longer term plan other than just land use and you know density of housing and retail. Um, and so they they were really excited about the potential to um, talk about trees. Um, and to think about a sort of adopt a tree kind of program that would come out of um, something like the application of the technology that supports tree tech. Um, ultimately, we went with Nubian Square because the Parks Department um, really kind of weighed in and said, listen, we'd really like to try this somewhere where we have a baseline. And again, because David and team from Speak for the Trees Boston had done a lot of that inventorying in Nubian, um, the Parks Department was really excited about looking at that area um, instead of Mattapan Square. So um, there was some back and forth. Um, you know, we, we certainly looked to Green City Watch for, for some reality checking, um, but ultimately the City of Boston internal partners really guided the decision on the location. Um, and then maybe Nadina, you could talk a little bit about how we decided which attributes maybe we could focus on or um, just some of those conversations in that early kickoff meeting. Yeah, because I think, um, and this is kind of central to how Green City Watch prefers to work as an organization too, which I, I think is um, quite unique actually for a municipality or any kind of government organization to actually accept that way of working, which is uh, through the idea of rapid iteration. And um, basically, I think we the project was set up. Indeed, it was a, it was a short timeline, but within that timeline, we made sure to make uh, time for I believe it was three workshops in the end, which were um, very interactive with with post-it notes and a, a short presentation from us, and then just really big questions. And then from there, asking all the participants, uh, and I mean, we had stakeholders from across uh, the city governments and outside of them to be able to join in and say, okay, if if, for example, if money was no option, how would you better manage the urban forest? Or if you could just have one piece of critical information about the urban forest, what would it be? And just to kind of let just, you know, have no guardrails and just say, okay, let your mind completely wander, use your full imagination. I think that's what really helped us get to the real crux of what needed to happen. And what we came to realize is that the real crux was indeed having locations of trees. And then from there, it was a bit of an experiment to see, okay, we know that we can do, or we're gonna experiment and see if we can do the locations of trees. From there, we've gone back as Green City Watch done our research, we think it might be possible to do attributes, you know, A to Z. You tell us which are your top three favorites and that's where we'll focus our energy. So everything, every decision almost was, it was a constant discussion together with, um, with all the different stakeholders. And I, I, I think that's on the one hand, that's, that's critical to a successful collaboration, but also as Green City Watch being a mission driven organization, really only wanting to build things that are useful. I think that was critical that you don't get, you know, hold yourself up in a basement and emerge three months later and say, ta-da, here is the product, but actually say, you know, this was in, done in constant conversation. So we know that even if the end result isn't perfect, we know at least that we did it together and that the lessons learned throughout that process are still going to be useful. And Mart, if I could just chime in with one more point before you switch to the next question. Um, 
you know, I think both Green City Watch and New Urban Mechanics and, and obviously the city of Boston more broadly really care about resident engagement and engaging the folks who are living on these streets with these trees or near these parks with these trees. I think as a an important distinction or, or a role that New Urban Mechanics tries to play is to make sure that when we do go out to do resident engagement, when we are invited into other people's tables, that we are ready to engage in that conversation. And because this was such an early stage prototype, we didn't necessarily want to go out and sort of have residents be part of that sort of experimental process with us at this stage. I think if if we are to go out and do another round um, and you know we, maybe we can talk about that a little bit toward the end, but I think there are many opportunities and really exciting opportunities to engage residents and to bring them into more of a, you know, if not necessarily a code design process because the, the source code is, is sort of written, um, but thinking about what are the applications, but we wanted to make sure that we were actually bearing the labor and we were doing the work as the city to not put that back on residents yet, not to say that it shouldn't happen, but just to say, we didn't even know what was gonna happen. And so we didn't wanna assemble a bunch of residents, get their hopes up, waste their time, whatever, you know, whatever version of that word you wanna use. Um, and so just to, to sort of make the point there about like how, what, what does co-creation look like or when does resident engagement happen? I do think cities need to take responsibility for being prepared um, before they go out to engage with communities. Yeah, thank you. That's a, that's an interesting addition. And actually, one of my questions was going to be, if you look at the outcome of the project, what has changed? Well, you both really answered that. I think it's um, it's really good to see how this project has changed over time with the state, all the stakeholders involved. So everyone was involved in all the decisions that were made. And as you mentioned, Nadina, that's really good to also have a joint result and not just something that's made by one person for the other. Um, I'm going to ask one more question and I'm going to turn it over to the, um, uh, uh, to the audience. Um, I, I, what I do wonder, uh, what makes for you both, and maybe you can give it a personal touch too, if you like, what makes this project unique? Um, if you think about how it has impacted um, maybe your work and your results, but also how you would work in the future. So what for you is a, a unique attribute of this project? I, I think for me, it was um, honestly just being able to do it. And I, I, and I think that's because uh, as a startup now open source collective in the field of urban forestry, so far we had been targeting, you know, all our hopes and dreams towards, you know, either the parks department or environment department or the sustainability office or, you know, some version of that kind of department and those departments are so absolutely you know consumed and busy and rightfully so with the day-to-day -day tasks that there's very little room um, for like Jacqueline said having those first meetings and have I mean you need to have people on your team that have the capacity to be able to even take on those meetings and that's really what what new urban mechanics is there for is to be able to engage in those conversations um, and I think that was one of when I got to know urban new urban mechanics better is learning that they had actually were kind of the first office of its kind in the States, maybe even the world, and we're now inspiring other cities to do the same. That and kind of have that civic R&D uh, research lab, I think is um, is critical to having projects that are so incredible, the, the technology we're using was so incredibly novel and also the application. Um, we weren't, we weren't even ready to hit parks department because we weren't even able to say to parks at that time, this is the outcome, that this is the output that you will get. And being able to work with new Uber mechanics and have them bring in those partners um, meant the world to us. And it meant the world to being able to develop tree tech as it is now. Yeah, I would add on that because um, I think that's, that's spot on. You know, our experience as well is just getting to do it is, is so helpful. You have to put one foot first and before you can put the next foot. Um, and so so I love that, Nadina, thank you for your perspective. Um, I think the potential for regional um, collaboration that Nadina sort of spoke to when referencing the Cambridge tree inventory and the MIT tree inventory, I think our parks department in conversations with them, they're very excited about the potential for that to think more regionally, obviously, you know, city boundaries stop at some point, there's a jurisdiction and okay, we have to live within that for, for budget reasons and, you know, political reasons. Um, but so much of the climate resiliency work and so much of 
um, those ecosystem services do not care about boundaries, right? They don't see, oh, this is Cambridge and this is Boston. So now I'm gonna, you know, stop providing my benefits. Um, and so I think, you know, as we move forward, um, our IT team who was very involved in the project, um, Kim was on the call earlier, as, as I mentioned, um, they're very excited to sort of stress test um, the open source code that Green City Watch has, has made available. And so we actually have um, an upcoming conversation to sort of take a look at, okay, what would it look like for the city of Boston to host this on our servers and to maybe apply it to another area? Um, of the city, whether that's another area of Roxbury or a different neighborhood in Boston. Um, and beyond that, you know, what are the conversations we can have with Cambridge? What are the conversations we can have with Chelsea and Everett? Um, I think one of the great privileges of being in a team like New Urban Mechanics and in a city like Boston that is able to provide the resources to make a nine person civic innovation team and has the leadership and the you know, the, the will to um, continue to fund this kind of civic R&D is that we need to pay it forward. We have a responsibility to support cities that um, maybe don't have the time or capacity to do these types of prototypes um, because they have maybe a planning staff of one. Forget a parks planning staff plus a transportation planning staff plus an environment planning staff. No, they have one planner. Um, and so if we can be a part of a collaborative solution that has the potential to scale across jurisdictions, across municipalities, um, and to create that space for learning. I think that's that's such a privilege and such an honor and is, is always so exciting in these kind of startup slash research type prototypes um, that we really get that sort of intellectual curiosity. We get the, the, the sort of goodwill of, um, you know, what is, the, what is the actual application of this? And that's been so fun um, in this example in, in particular, um, and in a lot of examples that New Urban Mechanics has gotten to, to hold over the past 11 years. Thank you. Um, so what I wanna do is if, if you have a question and you wanna field it, please choose the raise hand function. It's below in, um, in the black bar. Um, but I do want to ask, so when I asked the first question on who's been involved in the Startup City collaboration, there was someone from the Netherlands who also um, said he did. So, Stephen, I'm going to pull you into this meeting for a second. Um, it says you're rejoining now. So let's see where you are. Um, so if you would uh, let us know, tell us a little bit about how your example, how you've been involved in um, a cooperation like this. We're very curious here and maybe introduce yourself. Yeah, sure. Um, now, oh, great. Uh, thanks for the interesting stories, uh, Jesslyn and Nadine. Um, yes, to start, I work for Impact City. Um, so yeah, the program uh, from the municipality of the Hague behind the organization of Impact Fest. And um, yeah, within Impact City, I have several roles, but one of them is that I am the project, project lead of Startup in Residence. And um, yeah, Startup in Residence is a program uh, which we would stimulate the collab collaboration between, between the startups and between uh, the government, so the municipality, but also for our ministries. And um, yeah, let's say, um yeah from from inside the government we will ask our colleagues uh, what kind of social issues are on top of mind and that can be uh all kind of things um, but to give an example uh, in the last program we worked with envision and that is a startup um which uh, translated um words uh for blind people um to text so blind people um, got sort of hardware with which they um, got text into words so that they can walk on the streets to, um, yeah, to know what, what is happening. And um, we do that by, by a pilot period of five months. And um, we choose like the startups from, uh, yeah, from, from The Hague, but also from outside The Hague because we have like the collaboration with um, several ministries and the province of South Holland. Um, and we pilot them for five months and um, they get access to Impact City, but also they get a budget to, to, to uh, build a pilot or build software or hardware. And then and that way we stimulate them to, 
to grow in The Hague, uh, but also grow national and um, yeah, let's say international when it's when it's a good idea and when it's a, a, a success. All right. Thanks a lot, Stephen. And, and it's an interesting innovation you just mentioned because that's one that's definitely um, very important in our current COVID reality, I'd say, um, and for the access of those people. Um, all right, thanks a lot. I'm going to move you back to, um, uh, let's see, uh, back to, you might have to rejoin. So sorry about it. Sorry if you get thrown out if you have to rejoin, but I think I can just make you let's see. Oh, no. Sorry, guys. Uh, oh, I do it here. Sorry. Yes. All right. Um, as I didn't see other hands at this point, I'm just going to field another few questions myself. It's okay. Um, so what I wonder uh, for, for the both of you, um, and, and, uh, and I, want, I want to ask Nadina, because Jacqueline mentioned this a little bit. So as a startup, Nadina, it it's, can be challenging to, um, to navigate governments, but you've worked with several government actors, actually. Um, so can you speak a little bit for us to how you've experienced that and maybe also maybe mention one or two things that would be useful for other startups who are trying to work with governments or governmental actors, could be cities, could be municipalities. Um. Yeah, so it is absolutely true that in addition to Boston, we've gotten a chance to, to work with some um, 25 odd other cities, um, but we had a huge help in that. Uh, and that was because we had a main collaborator in all those uh, partnerships and that was with the World Bank. So we, um, because of the challenge that we won um, two and a half years ago, which kind of catapulted Green City Watch to even becoming uh, an organization, um, the World Bank was on the jury of that competition that we won. And from there, we were able to um, develop a close relationship with them, which then led to several other projects, which either the World Bank funded or the World Bank facilitated. And that was huge because it meant that we were able to, to get out there, um, but it was also um, not real life in the sense that you, you, know, you can only work with the World Bank for so long. And that's why um, the project with Boston was so special to us because that was the very first municipality that we worked with directly. And that felt like um, a massive milestone for us as well, knowing that one, we could get our foot in the door and actually do a project, but also to that the product that we we're offering that we wanted to build, there's a certain market validation uh, with that. Of course, if you have a big organization like the World Bank funding it, um, there might be an interest there on a strategic level, but that doesn't necessarily tell the force, full story on, from a market validation perspective. And that's definitely, we felt um, that from working with Boston. So um, my advice to other startups uh, looking to work with uh, the civic tech um, or, or looking to develop their product with uh, in civic tech is to, um, I don't know if I would necessarily Every, every person's journey is going to be so unique, um, but what I would recommend is reaching out to cities that have a new urban mechanics-like department. Uh, I think that's absolutely a great place to start, not only as a startup, but also because you know that municipality is going to be open to having those first meetings and calls with you. So that would be my advice looking back. Thank you, Nadina. And I have a question in the Q&A and I see Jacqueline partly answered this, but maybe you briefly want to touch on it, touch up on it, Jacqueline, because it's a, it's a good question. Um, David from Speak the Trees, curious to hear how this data might inform our work, uh, residential engagement in general and goals of growing Boston's urban forests. Jacqueline, is that something you want to speak to? Yes, and I'm just saying Marika's uh, note in the chat as well that we need to stop the call. So maybe um, I'll just say we, we can pick this up, um, you know, uh, uh, virtually, uh, more virtually. Um, Nadina shared her email and you can reach us at newurbanmechanics 
um, at boston.gov, which um, hopefully will be part of the materials that are sent out after this. Um, but I think, um, you know, just besides what I wrote um, in the chat uh, that you can hopefully read, um, I think thinking of other applications that I mentioned, um, and Nadina's team was really great at identifying what are other types of tree tech. So we had tree pit tech and dead tree tech. Um, what are some things that we could use this, these data for um, other than just, oh, cool, here's where the trees are and here's how healthy they are or not. Um, so I think, yeah, um, that's part of it and uh, look forward to continuing the conversation. Uh, I think you can find both of, all three of our organizations on Twitter and you can find our emails pretty simply. So thank you so much all for joining. Yes, I want to, I, I do want to take a moment because um, I know we have to go, we need this for the next session, but I really want to take a quick moment to uh, Nadina and Jacqueline, both of you, thank you so much for joining us today. I think you did a great job at explaining to to, uh, to me and to others, why civic innovation is so important and what you can actually do by working with a startup. And also how this process is different from just a cooperation that's normally between a city and a company. Um, so thank you so much for making time to join us. I hope to the audience that it was useful. Um, yeah, and hopefully we'll see, we'll see you all soon.